Hey, it's uh, six o'clock, so let's kick this meeting off. Can I oh. Mayor, do a quick sound check? Councilmember Donahue, can you hear us? Councilmember Donahue, can you hear us? Are you unmuted? I am. Hmm. Can you hear? No, he can't. You say he can't? Councilmember Donahue, you cannot hear us. <laughs> How would we know? <laughs> say something if you can't hear us. <laughs> Councilmember Donahue, can you hear us? Oh, you, you can see camera? me. Yeah, he's right there. Uh -oh. Okay, here on this side. We can see Barb here. Is there anyone else that can? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Barb, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. So it's on Ryan's side. Ryan, can you give me a heads up if you can hear me? Okay, well, why don't you work with him and yep. we'll get this going. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's kick this off tonight. We're going to have a uh, hybrid um, Lake Stevens City Council workshop meeting tonight. It's May 2nd, 2023. This uh, is going to be recorded and we'll later post on our YouTube channel um, so people can view later on. Um, so with that, I'll call the meeting to order and hand it off to Council President Jorstad. Thank you. I am going to also hand it off to our uh, visitors from the historic site. Thank you so much for being here. I understand you have a presentation for us, so I'm going to turn it over to you. No. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Okay. Now can you hear me? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> My name is Anita Cruz. I'm the president of the Historical Society, and this is Cindy Frazier. She's our treasurer and our Facebook and Instagram manager. And I apologize for the lengthy, lengthy slideshow. Um, we thought we had more time, so we only have 15 minutes. So we're going to try to cut it down. So um, thank you for having us tonight. If you remember, most of you, one year ago, we were here and shared our vision for the new museum. And now tonight, we want to update a little of what we've been doing in the last year. Slide. OK, the Grimm House, as you can tell, we are very excited because we finally got our fence. We're finally seeing progress. We're waiting for the installation of the gates and trellis, and we're hoping that will be done soon. And the fence company suggested we wait um, two weeks to let the fence dry out. We've already picked out the primer and the paint, and we're ready to go as soon as that's ready. And then we're waiting for the uh, enhancements to the ground, and then we can, the Lake Stevens Garden Club can start planting and putting in the backyard brick patio. Next slide. We've been gathering um, recycled wood, and a couple of the things we've used it for are the potting shed that you can see on the right there and the gate. Um, we built a covering around the back porch so we can store garden things, garden supplies. And the top picture is Reed McDougall. It was an Eagle Scout project. He did the back porch. And a big thank you to Kim Daughtry for completing the rail and the stairs in the front of the Grimm house. and for helping the Eagle Scouts with the bats. <laughs> okay, this slide is the damage in the wallpaper and walls in the Grimm House. And Public Works allotted $3,000 for us for repairs. So I contacted a wallpaper contractor and I met with him and we did a walkthrough <laughs> and it was pretty sad news that amount of money won't, wouldn't even strip the walls in half of a room. 
yeah, he was he quoted like twenty three hundred dollars just to strip the entrance in the living room and repair the walls. So I told him we needed another option. So he and I walked through room to room and we made kind of an alternative plan. So I'm going to write that up and present it to the Historical Society board for a decision and then I'll let council and public works know what how we'll proceed on that. Next slide. Our emphasis, and Mayor Gailey says, emphasis is on drawing people downtown, vision to activate downtown from Russ and from Jean. It's important to have a vibrant community with activities for its members of all ages. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with all the connections we've made with the community and with the activities that we have planned for the future. Next slide. One of those community activities was we were given the mill, use of the mill during Aquafest. We had a pop-up museum and that was a lot of fun and a great success. People really enjoyed the Aquafest history. Next slide. And then when we opened the Grimm House, we were able to have um, participate in the Harvest Fest. We had a um, over capacity crowd come through. <laughs> and then we were also open for Halloween. And again, we had an over capacity crowd. That was a lot of fun. We dressed in costumes and the kids all came trick or treating at the Grimm House. It'd be a fun thing in the future to have a haunted house in the Grimm House. So that's something we're thinking about for the future. And then we also um, opened the Grimm House for the Easter egg hunt, but um, we didn't get as big a turnout for that. The kids pretty much after they were done with the egg hunt, they were <laughs> out of there. It was raining and they were done. So we did have some families come through. And then for Winterfest, we decorated, as you can see in the picture, and had another record-breaking crowd come through. Okay, next slide. Some of our partnering opportunities have been the we did our second annual Santa photo in the in the uh, museum storage building, and that was a huge success. And then our annual uh, calendar fundraiser, we got a huge response on Facebook from the community. We had over 180 entries in the, and we only picked 13. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice to have the community partner in on that. Okay, then um, this year we were looking at our yearbook collection and we realized that this year's yearbook at Lake Stevens High School would be the 100th book. And so we contacted the Lake Stevens High School yearbook advisor, Tom Mollison, and shared that information with him. So he asked us to unpack some of our boxes of high school artifacts and put them on a table in a collage. And he came down and photographed them for the yearbook this year. And then Creator Zone, I know they have already come and spoke to council and talked about um, their interest in partnering with us. And we're very excited about that. Next slide. Oh, yeah. Um, we're also, we were also contacted by the Lake Stevens Film Festival. And we're really excited that they chose a historical theme of the train in the lake. So they've asked us to um, come and partner with them in their event. So we'll have a pop-up museum of the train in the lake. Watch. Oh. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, um, the Machias Cemetery, I don't know if you realize, but Lake Stevens doesn't have a cemetery. The only one lo locally is Machias and their records go back to the early 1900s. Um, and so they recently gave us all their records for safekeeping because they were afraid that they'd be lost in time. And so we have um, books and all the, the land plots and it's, it's kind of interesting anything else that we're partnering with them also. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk about what we've been doing to prepare for our new museum. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is, is consulting our written resources in order to plan for our new exhibits. Um, next slide. And one of these um, written resources are the digitized newspapers. And these contain the most recent history for Lake Stevens. And we just recently got a, a, awarded a $3,000 grant to digitize the re remaining of our collection. So um, we're in good shape there. Uh, and we received, um, or I guess we'll, we'll talk about the book, the books too. The digitized newspapers are important, but these are our history books that we have so far. And uh, these were all written before the digitized um, newspapers and internet sources. And so our first book was written in 1957 and it was published by the um, Lake Stevens Community Development Program. And it covers um, late 1800s, only up to 1949, because that's when, when they, their stopping point. And so then in 2004, our historical society um, started to collect uh, more information to add to the earlier book. And it took three years to try to add some more, fam mainly their family biographies that are on there. But the history part didn't really go much past 1949. So really, our, these two sources don't go you know, 70 years worth of history that's not written down anywhere. Um, so that's why these digitized newspapers are so important, because it does give us the history that's missing in these books. And when we're done with er all our projects, maybe we can write another one, but it's going to be a long, long, long time before that's going to happen. Um, and then Jim Mitchell's book was also written in 2004. And that one, uh, he has his memories of growing up in Lake Stevens in the 20s and 30s. And uh, if you haven't read that one, it, it's very, very popular. Um, it's just, Jim just has a, a way with words. I feel like Vanna, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much of our history again, is not included in anything written source. And so um, actually our Facebook page probably has more history, more recent history than, um, than any, any other source. And so we need to continue to research and gather all the missing pieces. Um, so we've been busy doing that part. Um, next slide, please. Okay, we're continually trying to um, Trying new ways to connect with the Lake Stevens High School alumni and former residents that moved away. And this relationship is important in order to um, seek out the history that they know that isn't written down. And they've been proven to be a very valuable resource. Not only do they donate, make some uh, nice donations, but they uh, bring in artifacts and then write some of their memoirs down and uh, give it to the museum. So that's been a, a they've been an important resource. And I realized that people weren't going to come down and visit the fire station and just look at boxes stacked up. And so we're trying to figure out how can we get people down to talk to. So we started inviting alumni to come down and get their picture taken with their yearbook. And um, we weren't quite sure how this was going to turn out. But right now we have 169 people that have come down just to get their picture taken. And now it's starting into a class competition where they're trying to get all their classmates mm -hmm. down here. And it's, it's been kind of interesting. Um, but we've, and again, every time they come, we find out more information or they give us something that they had or something that they know about. So it's been very valuable. We've had individual people come down. The gentleman on the right hand side uh, graduated in 1946. He's our oldest one to come down. And then we have groups that have come down and we couldn't, they'd stay for like two or three hours and we, and we wanted to leave and they still kept wanting to talk. And so it was like, <laughs> okay. But so we realized that. Um, when we have the new museum, we have a space for people to meet and just, you know, talk and, and relax and share memories. And so we're excited about that part because we know that we already know that people enjoy that. Okay, next one, back to our mission statement. Um, we feel it's important to have a community space where we can have a variety of educational exhibits, um, programs, and uh, events to draw people of all ages. We had been contacted by daycares and preschool and homeschool groups, um, wanting to know what they we could provide them since we didn't have a museum for them to visit. And so we're going, okay, this is gonna be interesting because the Grim House really isn't made for um, you know a large group of preschoolers to come in. And um, also the second grade classes typically came down every year to visit the museum. So we're trying to figure out something we could do that in the meantime, before we um, museums built. And so we came up with the idea with this hands-on history. 
Next slide, please. And um, since the, the Grimm House is more like a look and not touch um, uh, venue, we decided to come add a few hands on exhibits. And wherever you see this little hand, that means that someone can touch something. And so we're gonna try it with little kids, say, okay, you can touch if this, if this hand's there, but don't touch other things. Um, but one of the things is a stereoscope with all the slides and actually during um, Harvest Fest and Winter Fest, the adults enjoy that just as much as the younger generations. And then uh, we have a, a crank uh, phone that you know they can actually crank and pretend like they're talking to an operator. And then uh, we decided that we wanted to um, plan some more hands-on activities. Um, and so we started collecting items and uh, researching them and developing uh, text for what we call a hands-on table. And for example, we'd have something like this sitting on the table and the visitor would try to guess what this is for. And the next to it would be a booklet. And uh, once they've guessed it, they can turn over the page of the booklet and it would tell them that it's a rug beater or a carpet cleaner. It'll have some information on there. And then it'll also have a then and now uh, picture that shows what, you know, what it was used like then and then what replaced it, like the modern, modern vacuum cleaner replaced it now. We thought it'd be kind of fun to have a rug out there and actually let them beat the rug, but we're not quite sure how, the, how, we're, how we're gonna, how we're gonna fi fix that, but. Could it be used for those who touch and aren't supposed yeah, to? Yeah, really, <laughs> you're gonna get this. <laughs> Um, and so we thought we'd set this table outside when the groups want to visit, and then also uh, in, during selected days when the weather's nice and we know we can put the table out there. So if people are in the park, they can come up and look at it. Um, and we feel these will be a good draw for community members, especially ones with younger children, um, and it will draw them to the downtown area as well. And then in the new museum, we also have plans to have uh, several hands-on activities um, for them. Next slide. Okay, to help us create our educational exhibits that reflect our own unique history, we turn to the American Association for State and Local History. And they have a small museum uh, professional certificate program that you can, um, that you can what? That you can uh, participate in. <laughs> and uh, it gives you guidance. And then they have several courses that you can take to receive the certificate. And they're listed there. And I uh, recently, a few months ago, took the one developing exhibitions uh, design class um, from that, uh, that association. Okay, and so the class, um, it was kind of interesting. I, I um, haven't taken a class before where you have to go online and do portals and things like that. I, 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 uh, went to college quite a few years ago. And so it was kind of interesting. But the, the instructor was from, um, was actually employed at the Smithsonian uh, Museum. So she, um, and she had an incredible background. And then we had classmates in that class from all over the United States. No one was from the Pacific Northwest. Most of them were from the East Coast. But so it was interesting getting di people's different perspectives. And each class member would uh, choose one exhibit to design. And I chose the one on uh, 13, it's kind of hard to see that, isn't it? The yeah. blues on there. Um, it's on the 13 resorts that were on Lake Stevens in the early part of the, um, the century. And uh, each, what you had to do is do a text, um, a text box. And so you had, and then put different artifacts on there. So, and this is like a four by six, the, the piece on the um, left is four by six feet. So that's not, it's not that small as it is up there, but so it was, and it had, um, we have like a, a token from the Lundin swim that they, um, that they uh, pin on their swimsuits. And then we had uh, different pictures on there and then quotes from somebody who actually worked at Lundin's and ads for a swimsuit. And then on the right-hand side, uh, another photo and then a pair of water rings that people would use during uh, when they were learning how to swim. Next slide, please. Okay, so that, and then next to the interpretive panel, uh, we would have, we have two uh, swimsuits, wool swimsuits from Davies Beach um, that we'd have encased in a display case. Um, and then more photos. And then the right-hand side has all the pieces put together um, for the one display. Next, please. Um, 
Okay, and so then we have two more. I had like 14 of these different interpretive panels. In each one of these, you had to research the information. And again, it wasn't included in these books. So you really had to kind of, you know, see what pictures you had and find out what, inf what information you could find on them. And one of the popular things is Davies Resort body slide. People love to see that, that the photos of that slide. And then the one on the right was talks about competition among the resorts. Um, I was really surprised. Um, the resorts in Lake Stevens would advertise in the Seattle and Tacoma newspapers to get people to come out here. To me, it just, it would just, but they were competing with everybody around the area. And then we also have a brochure that was uh, a travel brochure that was written that talks about the different resorts and trying to get people to come out here. Next slide. And then uh, we were required to, you know, put all our dimensions. And so as you walk in the museum, this would be on the right hand side, and it, and it was a 13 foot section. And then we had to do like a bubble diagram and put where we're going to put each one of the um, exhibits on there. And then the, the traffic flow, they really had, you really did a lot of work trying to, um, to plan this out. And then we have some more of the text panels. And then on the right-hand side on the bottom, that shows the, the complete exhibit that's 13 feet, um, 14 feet tall. And so um, it has all those different pieces on there. And then um, a photo of the lake in the backdrop um, for the background of that. And then in addition, we had to address um, the multiple intelligences, um, accessibility, um, what prompts we were gonna use to engage the visitor. Um, we had to do Pinterest boards. We had to do um, participate in online discussions. So it really gave us a good idea of what, um, what we had to work with to, to do these exhibits at our new museum. In addition to this course, um, I also attended one called Exhibits on a Shoestring, and that was by the Washington State Historical Society. And the presenter offered a variety of really low cost ideas for exhibits that you didn't, have, you didn't have to spend a lot of money on. And she had, she'd been doing it for like 30 years and she has a wealth of information. And then I found out that she offered consultations that would help us with the exhibits also. So I was thrilled. We were, we are thrilled because we have some professional that can help us. You know, we can do the groundwork, but then she'll come and help. Oops. She'll come and help us. We'll put this. <laughs> Okay, and then anyhow, and this is the last one. Um, we are enrolled in a STEPS program, which is offered by the American Association of State and Local um, History. And this will help us identify our strengths and weaknesses. And it will also help us with um, the history standards benchmarks that we have to prove for our Washington Heritage Capital Grant, because they, they require you to show that you're meeting all these, these benchmarks. And so this will help us um, provide that information that that's necessary for the grant. And so thank you. <laughs> thank you for letting us share our mission. And as always, we'd welcome people to come visit us in our cozy little fire station. And um, and it's, co it's getting cozier and cozier because it's, it's, uh, getting, it's fuller getting fuller and fuller and um, we can hardly move in it. But anyhow, it's, um, we welcome people to come and see what we're doing. We were doing a lot more and we had a lot more to present, but we were limited on time. But um, we do have a... A lot to share. We have, we have a whole list of activities that we're going to be participating in the coming year. Um, for example, the um, film festival that I mentioned earlier, and then the um, wellness. We got the idea. We saw the Lake Stevens Wellness Festival is going to be in the park on June twenty fifth. So we're going to do a pop up museum at the Grimm House of Medical Artifacts. Mm. We thought that might be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something we've never displayed in the museum before. So are there any questions? We'd certainly invite you all to come visit us. You know, I'll be there. Thank you for coming. Um, the heritage grant that was awarded by the state has been approved. Um, Russ, do you have any particulars as to when that money needs to be utilized, how it needs to be utilized, and what can we do to move the, that forward? Yes, the, we do not have the contract yet from the state, but the money is part of the approved budget. I believe it had a, I want to say a two-year 
um, contract amount that would go with the state biennium, and it is for construction of the, the site. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> does the construction entail also the, um, the design and all that, or just construction? The design is 90% complete. Um, so really, it is just truly construction dollars. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I would like to thank the museum for being here. And also, before we got started, I asked for them to try to find out what kind of sailboats those are on the first page that they had, <laughs> because I've been trying to put a sea cadet um, group together, actually a sea scout group together. And the the whole idea of the sea scouts in Lake Stevens would be to build their boats and race them on the lake. Be, yes. uh, so if we're trying to get that set up, it's a long process. We basically got stopped by COVID like everything else did, but I'm getting ready to start that back up again. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've already put into the uh, ear of the mayor that when the museum is built, then the scouts will get the firehouse to do all this. And that's all the scouts, not just the sea scouts. So hopefully we'll be able to make that happen. Uh, but I, I am very interested in what classes of uh, submarine, Jesus, <laughs> what class of sailboats those are, because it looks like they're the ones that used to be used on the lake. There's no reason not to use the same ones. Yeah, they used to have a lot uh, of sailboat races were very, very popular, I guess, like 1920s. People would come out from all over the places to watch them. Yeah, there's two hours during each day in the summer that we can actually race. That's the only time it's <laughs> Cindy and Anita, thank you both so much for thank being you. here. Appreciate the information. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to discussion item B, City Hall Office Adjustments. Uh, I'll turn it over to Russ. Okay, Russ Wright, Community Development Director for the City of Lake Stevens. Um, good evening, Council. We just wanted to let you know what we're doing over at City Hall and the Annex as far as some movement of some office spaces. And then we're going to share the discussion between myself and Barb and Anya, and I think um, Jean will have some um, talking points as well. So the gist of it is we have 36 employees that are assigned to City Hall and the Annex. That includes the temporary, or excuse me, the halftime receptionists and moving our risk manager back to City Hall, as well as any vacancies. We have 33 workspaces. So as a management team over there, we've been working on some plans to consolidate the work groups um, together. So for example, finance has three workspaces that they're going to convert into five workspaces. I've already moved um, a couple of my staff into a shared small space that allows us to take um, um, two cubicles and turn them into three. And then likewise, the clerks would be converting um, one of the spaces into a double space over there as well. So at the end of the day, we'll have a net gain of two workspaces, and that will be for future growth in City Hall. We've established a budget or we gave an estimate in your packet of what we thought the furniture cost would be around $10,000. And we were pretty spot on. We actually placed the order yesterday for the new desks, and that was um, pretty spot on. One of the other things we wanted to point out is the parking count over there. So there are 49 spaces. 15 of those are dedicated for city employee use or fleet use. And I think the fleet takes up about half of those spaces. We also have two electric vehicle spaces and three ADA spaces. So the rest of the parking is shared with the park users and it definitely gets tight as we um, head into the spring and summer months. And so essentially we are limited right now on any further um, additional workspaces we can put in there beyond those two. There are some things that we had to look at in the design and consolidation of workspaces, um, some ADA requirements to make sure that the interior of the cubicles had enough space. Um, if someone was uh, wheelchair impaired, the aisle widths um, in the building, we had to take into consideration with um, the, the building code. And then likewise, um, we had to retain an accommodation area if there were young mothers um, that needed a, a quiet space like that to use. So anyway, we've worked hard to try and come up with a plan to work with our 
support groups. We've talked about shared office spaces. We've put shared office spaces into action. And then we've talked about um, some hotel spaces as different teams can do that to make the most of you know, what we have currently in that space. I'm gonna hand it off to Anya or Barb at this point, if they wanna add any additional comments. I can go ahead and start um, and just, uh, we did also look at anticipated growth for 2024. As you know, we have a, a yearly, we look at our strategic staffing plan with the department heads before budget season. And based off of last year's plan, uh, we haven't quite uh, finished this year's plan yet um, or started, but based off last year's plan and rollover, we would be looking at adding um, maybe three to five positions just at City Hall and additional three in public works or parks based off last year's plans. So we, when we had this discussion of the immediate need, we were also looking at future growth and what we would need to do to make those happen if requests were granted for future positions. And it's um, continuing to get more creative and bullpenning more um, if we were to add more positions in 2024. So I don't know if Barb wants to talk about the bullpenning strategy and her department really quick on what I'm talking about. Sure, I could do that. Um, since we have a new um, a payroll person actually starting in two weeks, um, as Joan has retired, and Joan has been fully remote um, since uh, early 2020, um, we knew we needed to bring that person in and have a desk for that person. And so um, through a lot of conversations, um, we have determined that um, I am actually going to be sharing my office with my finance manager. So we've made some space to where um, we will both be housed in uh, my office, and then we will create a bullpen um, out of the two cubicles currently that are the finance manager and the AP accountant. And I will house the um, AP accountant, the payroll accountant, and bring over the capital project accountant from the city hall main building into that space as well. That will open up the space out in um, the uh, main building for. Um, our risk manager to come over to get into this building to make space for public works. And so we're doing a lot of reworking. I know uh, um, Director Wright has done a lot of reworking in his um, cubicle space as well. So um, we've just determined that it's um, it's easier to do the bullpen situation. And our uh, my, my staff currently is um, looking forward to actually all being together in one space. So we're going to do this the best we can. Um, obviously, uh, it's not ideal, and we are talking about uh, potentially needing to invest in noise canceling headphones for everyone, um, just so that we can uh, continue to be able to work. But um, I think this is the um, the only only thing we have an option to do at this point in, in the space we have. So we are doing the best we can, and um, everybody's been really accommodating and. and um, and I appreciate the staff and, and all the work that everyone has put into this, this concept. Um, we'll definitely have to think more about it in the future, about what we're actually going to do. But um, I know Anya has some additional um, information she wanted to give. Um, so I will let her um, go back to that. So additional concerns that we've discussed as we move forward. Um, a big one, a big theme um, from a humanistic like, perspective is a privacy concern. Um, our walls are very thin there. Uh, we're unable to have private conversations and adding additional staff um, in this bullpen style on that side, we're adding um, two additional staff to that building with potential to have two more in the future uh, in just that little annex area. Uh, we also house HR and that's where the, the mayor's office is. Uh, we do have sound machines devices for some private conversations and we do have the ability of some conference room use, um, but they, they do um, get booked frequently and we're unable to use, we have two conference rooms. So we have conference room A and conference room B in the back, and we're unable to um, compromise the conference room B space due to um, Director Wright's um, point that we need to provide a um, breastfeeding and lactation um, accommodation room um, per state law. And we can't, we have to have a, be able to provide them a private space other than a restroom. Um, additional uh, privacy concerns that have come up as we grow is um, now directors and other managers, we already have managers that don't have offices and cubes, so they're unable to have private conversations with employees or staff. Um, 
We also are having a lot of park noise as the North Cove Park is being um, better accessed and used over the last couple of years. Um, and um, like like Barb had mentioned, the noise canceling headphones, um, we, we had talked about using that in the annex building, but uh, realistically, you might need to look at using that for all staff at City Hall at some point as we um, increase the number of staff. And additionally, it, it does affect um, morale, um, hoteling and sharing spaces, decreasing someone's like desk size in their private area. Um, does have an impact on like the the culture and just the work atmosphere in City Hall. And I think our employees are great and they're very flexible, um, but nobody really wants to give up their personal space or their personal bubble after they've had a their own private space for a few years or had that comfy room and now they're being asked to share. So um, we are seeing that, you know, there's willingness, but it is a, a real human perspective on um, this change. So I wanted to share that with you guys. I don't think I have anything else unless I miss anything, Barb, or... Uh, no, the only thing I wanted to uh, mention also is uh, Russ did say he put in a um, an estimate for the cost of these. We are um, adding, I believe it's uh, six desks um, at this point um, and chairs um, and a couple of um, uh, closet spaces and I believe we came to a cost right around ten thousand dollars so um, we will we're putting that all into one uh, budget line item right now and um, we will see if we can uh, accommodate those funds through other budget line items um, until we get to the next budget amendment and if we haven't found the funding elsewhere then we will um, come back to council and ask to increase that general government operating uh, line item to, to cover those costs. And I'll just add a few comments. I appreciate the work the staff done. Uh, the city hall building, you know, that's been there six years now and is designed to be a temporary building. And, you know, during COVID days, we had a lot of people working from home and that's changed now. Uh, customers are coming to city hall. They expect to see staff. So it's been challenging to have those conversations and then the privacy issues, you know, you get that many people working in the building and some of those QBs are right against the restroom. So there's no privacy and uh, that's been disturbing. And so we've had to deal with those concerns from staff. Uh, but overall, you know, we've been successful with City Hall, what we've done, but it's time to start looking into what's next to be able to move the city forward. And uh, we hope to come back with some ideas. I know City Council's worked extremely hard the past few years funding these much needed positions for our growing city mm -hmm. and staff's done a great job recruiting excellent staff and we want to be able to maintain those and and I know that's council's goal is to retain those uh, staff members so our hope is to put a plan together bring it forward to council something that we can afford as a community um, something that'll last for years to come so that's kind of our next steps uh, but we certainly wanted to get comments from council and your thoughts Wow, I, I just have to say that our staff is so amazing and I, they deserve better. I hope we can come up with a solution that reflects that because uh, anytime I'm over at City Hall, I'm just blown away by the hard work that's going on and they deserve better than that. I hope we can come up with a solution. Uh, it always costs money, doesn't it? Why isn't it just like, you know, but um I really, really hope we can come up with a solution because they deserve it. They really do. Gene, I have a question. When you say that you're looking at coming back to council with some ideas or proposals, is that um, in regards to the current footprint or the current space? Or are you looking at, um, like we've talked about in previous years, looking at uh, relocating City Hall? Or both, I guess. Um, relocating City Hall. The space we have is just too small. Uh, and it really needs to be parking for the park. I mean, it's really great. Like we've talked, citizens are here when we get here in the morning at 7 o'clock. And so um, that's what we wanted. That was our goal of downtown. And we've done it. So I really believe it's time for us to move along. Um, let this space become a parking lot and we relocate somewhere else 
we um, last fall or whenever it was, we looked at several alternatives and I think we need to brush those off. Uh, we've got the Chapel Hill site. Uh, while it's not sold, we're closed. So we'll have monies uh, available. So uh, that's what we'd bring back as a proposal. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Is there any chance that um, once the library moves out, we'll be able to use the police station? We've looked at that in the past. It's uh, just not big enough. It just isn't. Because um, you want a campus all in one spot? Ideally, culturally, it's it's outstanding to have everybody in one location if you can do it. Uh, the other thing that we're dealing with is public works is maxed out. So we've had recent discussions this week about do we need to take back over the VIC? And I know that, you know, that's a lease space right now, but we're double bunked at Public Works as well. And so um, we're just a growing city. And yeah. uh, these are good problems to have. Uh, I think that we've got some ideas to be able to come up with a fix. It's a long-term fix that we can afford. Uh, Marysville just spent, I want to say, 50 or $60 million to solve their issues. And uh, I think that we can come back with some alternatives, much, much less than that, that uh, will work for our community. Any other questions or discussion? Yeah, one more question. Since you mentioned the library word, um, might we use the library uh, after it moves out uh, as a community center or? I don't know. I just feel like it would be great to have something like that downtown. Uh, we're trying to energize the downtown, and I think we've certainly su succeeded at that. And it'd be great if we could utilize it in some which way that helps the community, even if it can't be City Hall. Just wondering. That's just a question. Don't have to answer. I think all the ideas are great to have. We put them in a bucket, and then um, as the dominoes fall, we can um, look at those. So what's the square footage of um, the you, library? Can you talk into the microphone, please? What's the current square or the square footage of the library relative to the square footage we have um, with the current city hall with the two buildings? I believe the space at the, the library is around, I'm going to say somewhere around 5,000 square feet. And over at City Hall, we are, the main building's around 4,000 square feet. The annex is probably 800 or 1,000 square feet. So it's roughly equivalent. Might be slightly larger, but it's. All right. I, I guess I just have one comment. I hope that whatever process plays out, that it's more transparent than the last process we had. Um, mm -hmm. What I don't want to see is have executive sessions where council is given limited information and pressured into making um, significant budgetary decisions without public input. Um, and I'm specifically referencing the South Lake Stevens option that was presented uh, within the last year. So I hope whatever process it is, is public and is transparent um, and as much information is shared with the council and others. Only thing I would mention is that I keep thinking about office space and I don't see many spots with, you know, if we need 10,000 square feet or something like that, I don't know what the number is or is not, but there's just not a lot of office space out there. You know, there's nothing there you know we had this spot up there that we were looking at and the costs were getting uncomfortable so to say but I keep looking at other spots where we might have room to build something or do something and it's there's not a lot of spots in Lake Stevens left for office space so I know that our there's challenges with limited office space there I appreciate the information that was presented tonight. I think um, my recollection when we had this conversation a year or more ago was 
we didn't have a lot of um, sort of concrete examples of or data around the, the need to move. And I feel like your staff have provided that for us this evening. Um, it's, it's, it's important to hear like real world examples of how this is impacting your team and your staff. And um, I think that information is really important. So thanks for bringing that forward. And I look forward to um, ideas and proposals. I think that, you know, I, I think all of us want to have a thriving city and if there are barriers in the way, I think it's up to us to look closely at what those barriers are. So thanks. My turn. So I, I agree that we need to increase our staff capacity, et cetera. I'm, I'm always in agreement with that. And one of the things I always agree with is paying our people what they're worth. And we definitely have a problem in the police department right now uh, with them not being paid what others are being paid in the area. And we're about a half a million dollars behind Marysville. Uh, and we're losing people to these other to these other jurisdictions because of that. So that's going to have to be made up too. So whatever, what my point is, is that, yeah, we've got a problem and then we all have another problem and then we have another problem. They all cost money, no matter what we do, because we're government. We're not, you know, we don't make money. <laughs> we spend it. So we have to take this on with our eyes wide open for all of the difficulties that we have coming up, not just one thing at a time, because that gets us in trouble. If we because then something else comes up and something else comes up. They're all important. I'm not, don't get me wrong. They're all very important. But we have to be able to come at this holistically so that we spend money in the right place at the right time. That is what the difficult conversations have to be. Is what is it? Is you know, is it uh is it we have enough money to go ahead and pay police officers by another half a million dollars a year? Or it's we are going to build a civic center, or is it, you know, what what is that? What is the most important thing? And that's what we have to decide. But we need the information to be able to make those decisions. So it can't just be one thing at a time. It just doesn't work. I would like to piggyback on what you said, and I um, appreciate the mayor's emphasis on public safety. Um, public safety is a top priority, and absent public safety, we have nothing um, in our community, really, um, if people don't feel safe. Um, and so um, it's important uh, to me that we support the chief and the mayor, especially in trying to maintain public safety. And I understand we have some staffing issues, and as you mentioned, Kim, um, our pay scale is one of those things that is affecting um, our ability to recruit. I feel encouraged by the um, creation of our uh, new position that will be looking at grants that might be available. I don't think it has to be an either or. Um, I do think we have competing uh, competing requirements that we need to figure out, but I but I think that we also have opportunities to look at other funding, um, and I'm I'm hopeful that we'll be able to um, we'll be able to get creative and meet all of the important needs of our city. So, need to encourage us to think broadly. Any further comments? All right, moving on to discussion item C, sign code review. We'll see the um, staff report and a link to the ordinance in our packet. I will turn it over to Russ. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll keep my comments short. Um, City Council had asked, or at least a couple of council members had asked that we bring forward the last sign code as it relates to temporary non-commercial signs. In your staff report, I provided the history of the adoption of our last ordinance. It started out as an interim ordinance to make us compliant with the, the Gilbert versus Arizona, um, or the Reed versus Gilbert, excuse me. And that led to permanent regulations um, with the city council. We'd had a lot of input and direction from our legal council. We'd looked at multiple examples of compliant codes throughout the region. And some of the issues that the council had been interested in were the ultimate sign sizes, you know, clean, clean right of ways, 
um, duration. They talked about a permitting scheme and there wasn't a desire to move forward with that. So the regulations as adopted are fully compliant with the Reed versus the town of Gilbert and they are constitutional at this point. Um, I have attached the current ordinance um, as an exhibit tonight. If anyone has any questions or specific items that they wanted to chat about tonight as it relates to the sign code, um, now's the time. Thank you, Russ. Any questions? Or I do, Russ, thank you. Um, so I do, what has changed in the three years uh, with regard to legal cases regarding the legality um, and the validity of our of our ordinance. So what has changed in the three years since we adopted it? Okay. Um, if any. Off the top of my head, I would say nothing, um, but I will hand it off to Greg Rubstello to answer that more fully if he has additional comments. Yeah, there's really been uh, no significant uh, change. Um, Reed uh, still is the law of the land. Uh, there have been a number of appellate court uh, decisions kind of further refining that but none of those cases uh really uh touch on what we have here or require us to uh, uh to do anything different um i guess the significance of of, of this at this time is because we have the upcoming elections coming uh it's important to get the word out that uh uh campaign signage they're they're uh, regulated as temporary signs here uh, in the city, and there are uh, requirements for those signs in terms of how big they can be and that sort of thing, just some different regulations, whether it's on private or, or public uh, uh, property. And uh, I'm not sure how best we uh, best we do that, uh, if we had maybe have something even on our website. Uh, yeah. I don't know how are we doing that, Russ? We do. But, yeah. um, so maybe going back to the what's changed in three years, I would say our enforcement has gotten better. Our um, In your staff report, it shows that our current code enforcement officer has removed, I believe it was 200 and some signs over the last um, 18 months, non-compliant signs. We make an effort during every election cycle to reach out to all of the affected campaigns, let them know of our regulations. We have posted that information as a news release on our website. So we do try to be proactive with um, our regulations, especially as it relates to campaign season. So, so I was going to ask, so as, um, I know our code enforcement is um, complaint based, but I also noticed in our code, it says all uh, signs placed or erected that do not meet these regulations will be removed without notice. Mm -hmm. So that to me suggests that it's not complaint based, that if, if someone observes it, city employee that they handle it appropriately. Yep. In fact, our code enforcement um, weekly goes through the city as part of his regular routine and does remove non-compliant signs. He'll reach out to the owner of the sign, let them know. We collect it at public works and then it's disposed of after a certain period of time if they don't collect their sign. So yeah, he does that proactively. I think there's a lot of issues with that last campaign season where signs were too close together then they removed all the signs and then it was a rush to put a sign and it just caused a lot of problems for our staff more so than anything and frustration and complaints is that kind of what happened last campaign season so i think the challenge was and this was i called the anti brett gailey clause um in d5 um when there was a big brouhaha about his signs and he's going to cut them in half and put them right next to each other um you can go back and listen to all the spirited comments from <laughs> four years ago if you want. Um, so the specific verbiage that was put in there says um, D5 says sign should not be placed within 10 feet of another temporary sign. And so that puts, um, and that's for the right of way, that puts code enforcement in a really difficult spot uh, to verify what sign. You know, like South Lake Stevens Road, there's space you can put 20 signs there all next to each other, not blocking anyone. But our code says you can't put one within 10 feet and so they all get taken down and then um so if you ask for a specific thing um that's one that i think is problematic um and probably should be considered for removal um because it's difficult to enforce i don't think it's fair to our code enforcement people um 
to try and navigate that. I'm just curious in regards to that specific D5, it, what is, what, how does code enforcement rectify that issue? Do they take down all the signs or do they take down like all the signs in between the ones that are 10 feet apart or what's the remedy? In, in that case, it's really been reaching out to all of the affected sign owners and telling them someone has not put your signs up correctly and come fix your signs. And sometimes that's been successful. Sometimes it hasn't been. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we've talked about that, and you're, you're correct, there's not really a fair way to determine who was first or last. I mean, jokingly, I said, um, take out the one that's closest to the road, because it probably got put in last, but, you know, that was, that's not an answer to um, this solution. But yeah, that is an issue, but it hasn't been something that's led to a lot of additional staff time. It's been an outreach to, you know, those campaigns. And that is one of the talking points council spent a lot of time on. The original proposal had them spaced at 25 feet apart. And I believe that's what was in the interim ordinance. And then through the final discussions with council, it was moved down to 10 feet because the desire, I think the language that was used was not wanting a wall of signs along rights of way. Mm -hmm. um, so there had been definitely discussion and direction leading up to that that 10 feet. That's a hindsight's 2021 there. So I think one of the specific things that happened last time was that on the corner of, for instance, Lake Drive and Lundeen, where you're on a corner, mm -hmm. and so everybody's putting their signs there on the corner. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. this specific thing on D5, I think really talks about going down Lundeen, you know, long yep. stretches of roadway, you're 10 feet apart, not bunching them all up, and you don't have the arguments, well, you put a sign too close to mine so they can't read mine as they're coming down the road, that kind of thing. I don't know who had that happen. I think his name was Kim Daughtry. But the uh, but the, but the thing is, it happened on specifically on Lake Drive and Lundeen was we took all the signs. And so one of them said, well, I was there first. Why did you take my sign? So we've got a, we got a problem there. I don't think that the 10, the 10 foot rule really applies on it that type of a corner where there's a backup. So I think it really just applies on down the roads. Um, that's the way I envisioned it when we put that in place. Yeah, that was when, when during that discussion, we would have a visual pollution along Lundeen of signs like every one feet that campaign was annoying. And so that was one of the reasons why we did that spacing to try to cut down on the visual nuisance of campaign signs. And understanding that, but now we do it on a corner where yeah. that doesn't really apply, but yeah. we're, but we're code enforcing it. No, that's not within ten feet. Well, and in we corner, to... we're going to look at sight distance, and that would be another section of the code that's, that they would regulate that that's fine. visual I mean, obstruction. Sight distance is fine, but if you just take the specifics of some of those corners, that doesn't yep. that doesn't it doesn't hurt anything. I mean, you could also go down to South Lake Stevens Road right out at the end at the end there, up on that great big rock wall. And, you know, okay, that's not bothering anybody. You know, it's not a sight distance thing. It said, but we took all the signs down. Why did we do that? Well, because it says 10 feet. That's not where we wanted this applied. I, I think we can all agree that's a section that we need to visit in the future um, and, and maybe do some massage on it. Yeah, but I think I, I think we are, there's agreement. And I think, I mean, if, if as we're talking, I remember specifically what the mayor is talking about with Lenny Parkway. I mean, it was like, it was crazy. So, and I think the issue was that you got the public works trying to mow that and having to pull all those signs out as additional staff time. And so there was the challenge with, with that. Um, so 25 feet in that case, you know, makes sense when it's a, a linear, like Kim was saying, but when it's up against a, an area like South Lake Stevens Road with that rock wall, it's, it's not a line of sight, it's not an issue. And so if we can massage the language, I think we can accommodate both and limit the visual pollution and allow people to have their signs within 10 feet and they can just not block each other. Yeah. If I recall, part of that was Red Barn had all those beer signs that were mm -hmm. pink, plastered along those walls and we were trying to stop that too. Mm -hmm. So there was a little more to it than that, but yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the problem with that is, is we've got two sign code, you know, we've got a commercial sign code, which is not included in what we have in our packet right now. I mean, look at the feather signs that everybody's been putting up lately, you know, Chipotle, you know, everybody's putting up all these feather, or not Chipotle, but A&PM, uh, which are not even allowed in our code. Which are gone now. 
which I know they're gone. But so, it, you know, those are the kinds of things we've got to be careful of is we're talking about a temporary sign code here, but we also have a commercial sign code that, sure. that we haven't been uh, in the past really good at, at uh, policing yeah. either. So. You know, I, I would suggest it's kind of difficult to get into the nuance now. I would suggest that this is something that we bring up um, uh, in this next year's um, planning cycle to, to to do those little tweaks you guys are talking about. Well, I think I think there's a, I don't know that there are significant adjustments, but I think the hand I think council did a really good job initially with it. I think there's a few things that we've learned whoops, over the four years three years, whatever, since it's been in effect that we can make those adjustments without a wholesale makeover. I think most of what is there is good. Um, and I think I've just got two other things that I think, and they're, they're slight adjustments. Um, page 43, I don't know what section it is. Um, the temporary displays of lighting, um, these shall be removed within 10 days following the holiday season. Um, you know, the city doesn't follow that with our holiday lights. Um, our lights are fantastic and they're awesome. And I come downtown sometimes specifically just to look at them. Um, and so that language and people that hire people to do that, sometimes it takes them two months to take down the lights within their cycle, the people that do that for a living. So I don't know that that language there is, is appropriate. And if there's something um, that we can do to adjust that, so that's not weaponized um and also so the city can can lead by example with regard to that you're on section five number five is that correct uh yes thank you um and then just the last thing that i have um is under the the height of the signs um i think with our the height was six feet in height and i think six feet is just um eight feet i think is more reason why i look at some of the lay of the land um, and especially the uneven land, um, eight feet um, seems more reasonable, especially for those that have bigger signs like a three by five or a four by eight sign, um, having it right off the ground with the uneven ground. Um, that's a little bit difficult. So if there's language that can allow for significantly uneven ground. Practically speaking, if we go up to eight feet in height, you're going to start hitting some building code issues because of wind load and things like that on the sign and actually foundation. So that, that's probably a is bigger, that, that would probably be a lot bigger issue than just. Um, okay. <clears throat> if I may, the only question I would have, Russ, maybe if you could expand on the definition of what is a temporary sign. <laughs> expand on the definition in the glossary or, or interpretation. Okay. So a, a temporary sign in, in, in the context of a non-commercial sign, it is a sign that has a general message for the community. So that could be a political sign. It could be anything that is, you know, related to free speech. So it is not a sign that would be permanently affixed to the ground. It would be on a stake. It would be on a smaller, you know, bracket. So that's sort of the, the non-commercial portion. There are temporary commercial signs that could be banners. They could be on their glass window displays, marking, you know, temporary displays, holidays, whatever occasion, special events. Um, but they are a non-permanent sign that doesn't have a permanent type foundation. So as a non-permanent political sign uh, that's put up in November, a year prior to an election, is that a temporary sign? It is because the messaging is protected. So potentially a sign like that could be up year round in perpetuity. Yeah. And we do have some political signs in the city and across the county that are up in perpetuity for presidential elections from, you know, three cycles ago, you know, um, <laughs> you drive across um, I-90 to Spokane, you know, there's a barn that has but that's on private property. Yeah, that's on private property, but it's the that's same issue. Private or public property would have some rights to continue display, so to display there, signs like that. Is there any limitation of being able to impose a definition on a specific time period for temporary signs within right-of-way? We had 
talked about that, that they could be removed within X days after an election. But um, again, I would probably look to Greg for some guidance there. Yeah, yeah that, that, the question is prior to the election. To, <laughs> I mean, if we start, you know, people start and they can do a PDC filing and then put their sign, right? Yeah. They can do that. Just, okay, I'm, I'm a year away from an election. I'm, I'm putting in a PDC filing and I'm from an election. I mean, look at the two charts that we have all the time. Yeah. Or so I, I think yeah. that, but and that's it, what I'm alluding to yeah. in the sense that it becomes in the mayor's quotation annoying <laughs> um and i you know it seems that's just a little overboard around here um and so i so, guess i'm wondering if there's anything that we could possibly do to limit that well when the uh, of course when the supreme court said that we can't make these content-based dis distinctions uh it it became much harder to have these special types of conditions for for political signs which is why in our ordinance they're just included in with all temporary uh, uh signs and uh, um that you know the hope is why would somebody want to maintain a of course the temporary signs too they're they're made of materials that aren't going to last we have requirements in the code that the signs need to be maintained in a good condition so you can't really have a temporary sign that's going to be up all year around or for a couple of years because it's simply going to get into a condition that it's that it's will have to be removed and that's really our the the mechanism that uh, we're relying upon so that we're not going to have temporary signs that way now if there are permanent signs that people have Put up especially on their own private property and then that's another issue altogether so the, so i think that what councilman peterson is saying is okay what's the definite what's our operational definition of temporary well it's we have quite a lengthy one here but but i mean the key the key part there there's I'm talking we don't have anything that talks about time in no temporary, which no that temporary denotes time well, temporary, I guess, in the context of the way it's defined in our code, is that it's a, it's a sign that's made not to last too long. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a sign that's made of uh, you know more. Uh, is there a way that you and Russ could get together and try to come up with a more logical definition of temporary that is legal that we could kind of circle the wagons around a little bit? When you well, say more logical, like what is it that you're? Well, I mean, I think what it is, is these political signs are up right now. And I, I think what we're saying is, how long do you want to have a temporary sign up? Nine months, 10 months? Is it less than a year? What is temporary? So specifically around the time. Yes. I, I think you might, Greg, you might stop me before I say something I shouldn't, but I think that you start running into some First Amendment stuff. Like, say, for example, if someone puts up a sign in November, they obviously have to file and then they obviously have that First Amendment right to say, hey, I'm running. So I don't know how we, if they filed and they've said I'm running, I don't know how we could. That's, that, that's really, that's really the, the, gut, uh, the, the gut of the, um, the, gut of the issue. A, a, a skill, right? And yeah, these are, these are non-commercial signs. Somebody can put up a, a sign that says, uh, 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 whatever, I, 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 I love flower arrangements, you know, and took them on the side of the road. Uh, uh, I hate, uh, uh, I don't like to swim in Lake Stevens and put up a sign. And, and I don't know who would, but 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 somebody could do that. And th these are messages uh, regulated by the First Amendment. And if you, uh, um, I'll take another look to see if anybody's come up with anything uh, great, but uh, at the time that we, uh, that we adopted this uh, this ordinance. I remember uh, uh, looking at for those types of things, and I think we had some discussion uh, about it at the time. But uh, well, we struck we struck the three days after come down within three days. We struck that. Well, yeah, that had to go. So from what? Okay, so using a, unless all temporary signs. So I mean, an example that you just stated. Sure. Not, um, so non-political. I love I love the to dive in the lake 
Okay. okay. I put that up. And as long as I maintain that sign, even if it's in the right of way, mm -hmm. yes. as long as I maintain that in a, in a real nice sign, yep. you yeah. can have it up there. Sure. Forever. forever. Yeah. That was part of Reed versus Gilbert um, going back, that it was a public right of way is a common forum for public discourse. That's and true. that's where all of these signs have so never come first from. and fourth amendments. So I get it. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. If we can't, we can. I just was yeah. thought yeah. maybe there was something we could circle yeah. the way. And we might be able to. Yeah. We'll take another look, but I is sorry, it, it is a problematic area. Thank you. Any so, further? Oh, yeah, okay. one more. Yeah. So let's go back to uh, the distance thing that we were talking about. I I would or, or I would ask Russ, if you're talking to the code enforcement people during the campaign and you explain to them what the council, I think, is saying, is it linearly down the road is what we're talking about, but not on corners or block, rock walls and things like that, and have them, the code enforcement people understand, we don't want to take those signs down because they're going to be all together. And most of them don't know. They don't try to block each other. But you know, that's, if they're doing that, then it's up to them to block campaign to campaign. Is that doable to with the sign code we have now? Because you're you're giving you're giving your staff the what you think the interpretation. I could definitely look at an interpretation. Um, I don't want to give too strong of an answer tonight, but yes, that could be something that could be part of an interpretation. Holistically looking at the other sections of the code that provide different types of guidance for site obstructions at corners and, and things like that. So that is that is a possibility, but I would want to sort of look at those sections together before you know, you say giving a strong answer, right? I wouldn't expect anything less, but I'm just thinking that there might be a way of mm -hmm. having a discussion with them and saying this is what we're allowing under this code, but you know, the 10 foot rule down the linear yep. and that. So we don't have that same problem we have like. Okay. So I heard four things, well, five things. Um, so talking, you know, reevaluating the site separation looking at the section on temporary displays of lighting. Um, that doesn't look like that was something we actually looked at in the previous iteration, um, but we can take a look at that. Uh, is there any way to limit time before and after elections? And then what does temporary mean? The other thing we talked about was the sign height, and I will double check, but again, I think that would be a building code issue. Um, as far as process goes, I can report back out to the council on these questions. If you wanted to stick with just these handful of issues and there's consensus, we are in the middle of a process of doing a code cleanup. So we could add that to that list. Otherwise, as the mayor suggested, if it's a substantial uh, review of this code, it would need to be part of its own work program and any code amendment, even this, it's a four to six month long process because there would be a review with the planning commission, public hearing with the planning commission, reviews with city council, et cetera. But if we keep it to just these, you know, up to these four items, I think we could probably handle it with our code cleanup. But if it went much beyond that, it becomes its own project and there is quite a timeline associated with that. I'd be happy with code cleanup. It kind of solves a, one of the big issues we have before August or say gets here. Yeah, I agree with that. And I also think that it clarifies some of the intent of what the council initially intends to do, but the verbiage would just wasn't what it needed to be. Um, so I would, I would support a code cleanup. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Good discussion. Discussion item D. Uh, back to you, Russ, to talk about the Lake Stevens Industrial Center grants. Okay, this is just more um, of a report to the council. So last year, you had passed a resolution on this industrial site readiness grant that went to the Department of Commerce. 
Um, we came in eighth on that proposal statewide, and they only funded the top six, and we had asked for $500,000 to do a full design of the sewer line on 131st and a design of a lift station um, to support the eastern part of the site. Fast forward to last week, Department of Commerce reached out to me and said after the end of this legislative session, they still had a little bit more money and were contacting the jurisdictions that had been next in line. And so they said, do you want $208,000 to do something? And I said, yes, please. So we are working towards um, a design just now truncated from the original ask just to do the sewer design for 131st, the extension of that sewer line over to Machias, and we'll take it from the tie-in to the commercial or the uh, residential project as far north as we can, and then to the east to Machias. Um, been working with Director Halverson on that. He, um, in the staff report, it said we're working towards getting a consultant on board. Um, it sounds like we are now a little further along than that and that we do have a preferred consultant. So we're in contract negotiation now and we are hoping to get a work product turned around in the next eight weeks and spend as much of this funding as we can to get that sewer design done. Um, likewise, after we didn't receive that grant, I started looking for other pots of money. And there is the, the CURB, um, which is a Community Economic Revitalization Board. And they had a planning grant available. And so we applied for the full $50,000. There would be a city match of about $12,000. And we have made it through to the second cut. And May 18th, I will be going down to Olympia and presenting our application to the curb board. And what that would do is we would take that $50,000 to do the siting analysis for determining the appropriate location for the sewer lift station in the Eastern part of our industrial center. So like I say, just um, a report out to the council tonight on some of the activities we're working towards in our industrial center for future economic development. Great news. Thank yeah, you. grants are grants. We'll take what we can so you have you have to spend this before June thirtieth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You make it. I stop. <laughs> we're going to try. <laughs> Who's that consultant we're bringing on board for the the analysis of the sewer line on one hundred thirty first? Um, I'm not going to say tonight because we don't have a final um, contract negotiation. Hmm. And staff right. has kept the sewer district. Yes, we have. Okay. Say that again. Staff has kept the sewer district in the loop on this grant process and the design. And they've been a great supporter and have provided um, letters of support on both applications. So. Great, thank you. Discussion <clears throat> item E, impacts of legislature decisions. Yes, yeah, kind of wanted to open it up, uh, open the floor to discussion, mostly about um, the Blake decision and the legislature's um, lack of um, providing a statewide fix to the Blake decision. Um, as y'all know, you passed um, a local fix in March, April. Yeah, uh, goes March. To effect July 1st, um, which is great. Um, on the mayor's coalition um, side of things, um, all the mayors have decided that we are working on our own on individual ordinances that are uh, copacetic with each other to make sure that we don't have weird ordinances um, between cities. Um, so we're all kind of using the same language. I did. Uh, and then as we all know today, if you don't know, um, the it looks like they're going to do a special session May 22nd on on uh, on whatever compromise they've come together. So um, our ordinance may be punked soon, um, but we'll see. Um, but in the meantime, we're still going forward with um, creating our, our, our local ordinance. And I asked Greg to take a look at it again to make sure that we're not um, knowing what we know now, if we need to do anything to it uh, before July 1st to make sure that, that we don't have any holes. 
Yeah, I, if, if assuming the legislature doesn't come up with a, a fix in a in a in a special session, I would anticipate that we would be bringing back a proposed ordinance probably in in June uh, to deal with the both the uh, both the possession and and, and the use uh, aspects of uh, of uh, drug use. I mean, because the the, leg, the our local ordinance now complies with the existing state law with respect to uh, possession, right? So we're going to want to change that uh, because now we have the ability to make that uh, gross misdemeanor. We don't have to have the three strikes before you uh, before you can be charged with anything. So we want to deal with that sense. We, we with that issue, we've. Um, we passed a uh, a use ordinance. Um, different cities have come up uh, over time with some, I think, some tighter definition and better definitions of what uh, constitutes use and how you. And uh, so, I think we can improve. We can improve on that. Uh, there's also been some uh, local legislation dealing with. Uh, the problem of drug paraphernalia, uh, treating it uh, somewhat like um, littering that, uh, and making it a criminal offense. I had a good discussion uh, this afternoon with uh, Jim Zacker, the city's prosecutor, about from his standpoint of uh, what, uh, what uh, he'd like to see and what he's been seeing because he represents like 17 their firm represents like 17 jurisdictions. So he's he's seen a lot and hearing a lot of what's going on. But 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 I would anticipate uh, if there is no legislative fix out of a special session, we will make some changes. We'll bring that uh, back to you. Of course, if the legislature comes up with um, this is the way it is, uh, then we'll have to uh, have a local ordinance that complies with that. Yeah. Mayor Gailey, you've talked about the mayors are in concert with everyone. Where is the Snohomish County Executive and the Snohomish County Council on this issue? So I know that um, I know that uh, Councilmember Naring and Councilmember uh, Me came together and presented an ordinance. Where they are at in their process, I don't know. Um, but I know that they're working on a, on a county level, which is good. You don't want to have <laughs> no ordinance across the street on Evergreen and Airport and an ordinance on the other side of the street. So, Have you talked with County Executive Summers? I haven't, no. I think there are similar issues happening at the county level than happened at the, are still happening at the state level. Um, you have five folks who have very differing opinions on the best way to proceed for our community. So, well, it's just, I guess it's ironic that we have pretty much all the mayors in this county on the same page, and we have a county executive who has the largest population of, of residents in the county that's not on the same page. So, uh, I think it's kind of unfortunate in no, that sense. Well, he hasn't said he hasn't said anything. There's no position. There's nothing publicly that he has stated um, in support or uh, against what the mayors are proposing. So I guess that's the issue is there is kind of, you know, where is he on the issue? My understanding is he's waiting to see what the county council, uh, the county council can develop an ordinance that he either supports or doesn't support. But you're right, it has to be. Okay. I did have a follow up. So, I mean, as far as enforcement, so it's a gross misdemeanor starting July 1 if nothing happens. But if the prosecutor does like they have done, where they've decriminal essentially decriminalized drugs, they're not arresting, they're not charging. Um, do we know where they stand with uh, with the gross misdemeanor versus it being a felony? And are they going to take any action or do we know that at this point? So we would have control of that. Right, our, our, our local prosecutor, uh, if we, we, we have a gross misdemeanor ordinance, he, yeah. he will use it. Yeah, yeah, on, on, a, on a municipal- And the district court. Municipal court, we would have control yeah. of 
making sure the prosecutor prosecutes that. On the county side, it, it, it wouldn't be a, it, that wouldn't be our purview. We have contract that out, correct? With, with our, our, our court? Municipal side? Yeah. So we know what other jurisdictions share the same. It, what was this? Did you say 17? Share the same prosecutor? Um, yeah, he, his firm represents. I'm just saying, as far as consistency goes, you brought the point like on one side of the street, you're, yeah. you're right. Yeah. The other side of the street, you can, it's a free for all. That's yeah. obviously one of his concerns for his firm <laughs> and his prosecutors. They don't want to have to deal with a hodgepodge of, uh, of Warden Caesar. So he's trying to help encourage everyone to kind of come to the same consensus on our local ordinances, which I think is the ideal thing. That'd be a wonderful thing if if we as cities uh, can do what the you know maybe the the state legislature failed to do. But that that'd be great. And the county. And the county. Well, we'll we'll see. I mean, I've seen their draft the draft ordinance that that came and and it it, it deals with both use and possession as a as a gross misdemeanor. Mm. So it's a lot of cooperation to try to get to come together. <laughs> So that's what I have for you on the legislative side. Hey, Aaron, I have one. You know, the county council tomorrow's agenda that's on their agenda. For, for when? For tomorrow morning. Oh, for tomorrow morning. Well, there you go. We'll kind of get what, an idea. What time is that? Uh, it's ordinance 23046 for the county, and it is at 9 o'clock, May 3rd, Jackson boardroom and remote meeting. We shall see. And then May 22nd might just trump everything. If they get the vote. Can I just share some just a little anecdotal bit of information just for your just so you just so you know. Currently, when folks are um, jailed at Snohomish County Jail and they are interested in treatment, drug treatment in particular, they're able to request that. And I would say just our team um, in my work at the county probably get 10 requests, 10 to 20 a week, people that are interested in, in wanting services. They're generally released before we can ever see them. We get that, it, it takes two to three days for us to get that information by the time we get there. They're not there. The, the, the good part about some of this legislation is it keeps folks in jail long enough. For those who are requesting services um, to, to have someone who can start intervene and start talking to them about what that path looks like. The, the, my biggest concern is that if, if there are that many more people who are requesting people that services that people can actually follow through with. Yep. If there are that many more people that, that are requesting services where we can actually follow through, we don't have the treatment services available to actually help the number of people that, that want those services. Um, so I just, I think that's just an interesting part of the, of the puzzle. Um, I, I'm all for like whatever tools we can use to try to get the people that want treatment connected to treatment. Um, but it's going to take, I think, a statewide approach to expand the availability of treatment for all who need it. If we're keeping people incarcerated longer. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with you. The you know, part of the state package that they were looking at was what two hundred and eighty million dollars to help out with treatment, and really the house should have just passed that portion of it, um, just to get that going. That that should be a given uh, on either caucus, right? Um, so I agree with you, uh, President Jorstad, that uh, treatment's a huge part of this, and it's not um, talked about as much that. Hey, we can put as try to put as many people we can through the treatment pipeline, but that pipeline's pretty pretty tight. And and given who we're working with now, going to jail is not a deterrent for use the type of drugs that are out on the street right now. It, without any type of intervention, whether it's a week or a month or a year, that's where they're going back to. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. It's a good note to. Finish on. I'm going to add some notes. We have a um, draft agenda for next week. Is there anything positive on it? There's all everything's positive. Everything's positive on it. 
well, the bio is kind of shit. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so next week we'll be uh, it will have a resolution for Juneteenth and a resolution for cybersecurity policy. Uh, we'll talk about the Exxon body work cameras contract. There'll be a power line update. And then we'll have executive session to discuss with discuss the location of the ammunition The power line update is at the park. Yes. Okay. Is that in conjunction with Marysville's planning or just our side of things? I think that's going to be where we're what we're doing this summer on our portion of it. Down on South East 20th. 20th. Yeah. Okay. Our first gap did participate in Marysville's recently. Yeah. All right. Anything else? All right. Now you can go. All right. Let us adjourn. Yeah. Do good things.